Today is a sad day. A light has gone out in my life and in the lives of so many of the English-speaking terror community worldwide with the patira of Murray Varebi, Daim Chanach Erentrei, Zechat Tzadik Livracha. At the age of 90, will be buried tomorrow morning in Haram Luchas in Yerushalayim. So many people owe him so much. I'd like to speak about him just for a few minutes, some of my experiences with Chanach Erentrei, and maybe a small connection to the Pasha's told us, which may be of interest. Dain Erentrei somehow managed an amazing amount in every day of his life. And the Pesach says, for Avram Zokein Bo Bayamim, that he was Bo Bayamim, that every day was packed full. And I always was astounded by the amount that he was able to pack into every single day of his life. Dain Erentrei was originally the Rosh Bezdin of Manchester, then he moved to London, became the Rosh Bezdin of, of London Bezdin, and then eventually of the European Bezdin, and he dealt with some of the most difficult halachic issues imaginable, whether it was kashras issues, shechita issues, whether it was geiras issues of conversion, complicated conversion, whether it was gitin, whether it was dine teira, whether it was building mikvas, whatever it was, he was involved in setting up a bezdin and maintaining a gold standard in halachic practice that the kashras and everything should be of the top quality, and that the mikvas, and that the shuls, and that the rabbonim, and that everything should be going exactly according to the Torah to maximize the levels of Klal Yisrael in the whole of the UK and wherever he went in Europe. And somehow he did this all with a smile and with warmth and with, with absolutely indefatigable energy, which was really astounding. And of course, at the same time, he had a full calendar of simchas and bar mitzvahs and conferences and trips, trips abroad for rabbinic purposes, and somehow he managed, in this amazing uh, achievement of his life, to find time for individuals, to find time to look after, to engage in chesed at the most remarkable level. Speaking personally, I came to London in 1984 the same time as he did. He came from Manchester in 1984, and for 35 years that I was the Rav of the Shul Ner Yisrael in London, he was my... Urim Vatumim. He was my go-to person for any consultations, for any advice, any time I needed some clarity, some encouragement, somebody to come with me or somebody to give a great talk. He was always there, always made himself available in the most remarkable way. And he was, in many ways, became my Rebbe and also, in a sense, my uncle, in a certain sense. He was with his warmth and his invitations and there was hardly a week that I wasn't in his house discussing certain things. Just two or three small anecdotes I'd like to share with you about my life with Diane Erentrei, which some of which remain in my head. One of them was when we, uh, in 1986, we had just bought the new building, which we still have as a, the Neri Israel Shul, and we had a Hanukkah Sabayis and a Hachnosah Sefer Torah, and we had three Sefer Torah. And I was carrying one, Dan Erentro was carrying one, and Isaac Bernstein, Zichron of Racha, was carrying one. And uh, we were standing, waiting to come into the shul. And of course, I said to Dan Erentro, you go in first, he's the Rosh Bezdin. He's 20 years older than me. So he says to me, no, no, I'm not going in first. You're going in first. You're the Morad Asra. This is your shul, this is your Kehela, you've got to go in first. So I said, I'm certainly not going in in front of you. You're the Rosh Bezdin, you go in first. Anyway, he said, I'm the Rosh Bezdin, so you've got to listen to me. I'm telling you, you're the Morad Asra, you go in first. And he insisted that I walked in first in front of him because he felt that the Hachnosah Sefer Torah and establishing a shul, the, a vital issue in every community was the status of the Morad Asra, that the community should have no doubt uh, who was uh, the, the, Rav, the Rav of the shul. And this was something that was something which he came back, a theme that he came back to uh, on many occasions. But the way he did it, with warmth and with encouragement, and he, I felt empowered by him in many, many different ways. Another small anecdote which remains in my head was once, I often, I often, whenever I got a chance, I drove him around in various different places. I was driving him once in an early evening in Golders Green, and he said, oh, we just, I just want to drop into this house 
uh, for a short while, come with me. And it was a, a, a young couple who had their first baby boy, and he'd done a bris mila yesterday. And he was doing an after-sale service. He was coming to see how the baby was doing, and he went in, etc. And he saw, I, I noticed, that he saw straight away that the mother was a young, nervous mother. And he asked her, how are you managing? So she, she was a bit nervous about how to look after the, the mila and the, 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 to tend to the mila and to bathe the baby. He said, I'm not sure how to bathe the baby. I don't know how to do it. So he said, right. He took off his jacket. I remember he gave me his jacket and his, <coughs> his langerekel and his, and his hat. Roll, he literally rolled up his sleeves, said, right, where's the bathroom? He went into the bathroom with the baby, r ran in the bath, and for 10 minutes, there he was, the Rosh Bezdin, showing this uh, young couple how to bathe the baby with its with, so, so it's not in the right way after the bris mila. And he did it all with a warmth and an encouragement. And uh, I'm sure uh, they, uh, uh, the young couple in question got a tremendous chizuk out of, his, out of his visit. And this was just the human touch, as if he had all the time in the world. He wanted to make sure that this young couple enjoyed their baby and were not too nervous about it. And he gave them, he gave them uh, 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 that strength. There are lots of anecdotes I could tell you also about, for example, in the in the 1990s, where Dain Ehrentroy uh, came on board as the uh, as the halachic authority for the London Eruv. So we were running, the Eruv committee was running the Eruv, and we had taken the initiative, and the Bezdin finally came on board after Dain Ehrentroy got the green light from Rabbi Yoshev, and he, but, but he came round with me, and he wanted to inspect every single inch of the perimeter every place where we're going to put a pole and a wire and what what what, what walls we were using and i must be honest with you i remember going for a drive with him for three or four hours and he was running up and down and measuring and mapping and and asking questions and and and, and i could hardly keep up with him and he had a tremendous energy and he did it all with a tremendous amount of chokhmah uh, make sure that the map exactly of where the poles and wires went was absolutely according to his understanding. Of course, it was Rabbi Jeremy Conway who did all the work putting the poles and wires in the ground, but Diane Andrew had to make the map, X marks the spot of exactly where everything went, and he had to do it in the greatest detail. He was a details person. I also remember then the when in the very beginning we had some questions, halachi questions about certain difficult parts of the Eruv, and I went to Diane Andrew's house, and I asked him about a particular question about how the area was going to work. He said, oh, that's an interesting Shiloh. And he goes to the shelf and he takes out the Chazon Ish on Maseches Erevin. And he opens it up and he finds the place. And I could see on every second page, there were notes of his uh, uh, footnotes and cross-references and questions all the way through the Chazon Ish on Erevin. He had really learned, Erevin. he had never built an area before in his life, but he had learned Erevin at a depth which I hadn't found with any other Rabonim in the whole of the UK at the time, and that was one of uh, something which I was uh, I, I was involved in. So he had the knowledge, he had the patience, he had the energy, he had the human touch, and he had the the, the pure Torah, which came out of his mouth. Kisifsei Koyen Yishmeru Das. Out of his mouth came Das, came understanding, came the wisdom of the Torah, the Torah Yevakshumipiu. He made it a pleasure to go and, and uh, uh, hear terror from him, hear wisdom, hear encouragement from him. And this was something which uh, remained with me um, my, my whole life. I was thinking that the Chazal, the Gemara in Baba Basra says something about Parshas told us, which isn't evident immediately from our first reading. In Parshas told us there's a very small episode of just six psukim, where Yaakov and Esau are young men, and Esau sells the, the, the rights of the firstborn to Yaakov. And it's an interesting little episode. And what does it all mean? And we find that Yaakov pays him money, they make a kinyan on the, with a the soup, and he makes a shavua, and, and the story ends up not just with Vayimko, not just that Esau sold the, uh, the birthright, but Vayivez Esau was Abachor, he despised the birthright. What, what is going on here? What is it? And the truth is, this incident was a, a crossroads incident. From that moment onwards, Yaakov and Esau each went their own way and developed into diametrically opposite people. But what's the backstory to this little episode? 
So the Gemara and Baba Basra at Zayin tells us that the back the back story was that this was the day of the Patira of Avram Avinu. The great Avram Avinu at the age of 175 had passed away. And that means that the Yaakov and Esau were 15 years old because they were born when Avram was 160. So they were 15 years old. They were twins, teenagers. And they were responding to this Patira, to this death of a great man. And their responses to this to this uh, a powerful event were going to, going to shape the rest of their lives. And this is very fascinating. Esau heard that Avram Avinu had died, and he went on a rampage. So, Chazal, Chomesh, Averus, Ovab, Osayo, a day of violence and corruption, murder, rape, blasphemy, whatever it was, he was, he felt that that's it, Avram has died, he's no longer under supervision, he can do whatever he wants, and what, what he wants to do is a life of violence and, and self-gratification. And not only that, this is driven by a sense of nihilism, a sense of if Avram, the great Avram, can die, then life is meaningless. Then life doesn't mean anything at all. Then we're all going to die. And therefore, what do I need the Bechera for if life is meaningless? So this nihilism-driven rampage of Averus is Esau coming in, but who, oh yeah, if he's exhausted. Yaakov is also responding to the death of Avram Avinu. But he's thinking, who's going to take the mantle of leadership into the next generation? Avram Avinu carries the promise of Am Yisrael, of Eretz Yisrael, of Mamlechas Kohen and Vagay Kodesh. It can't possibly be this man who is a violent, corrupt hunter, right? Who gives in to his basest passions. It can't be him, right? So he, so he so to speak, buys the Bechorah from him just to see how would he respond. And the answer was, He despised the Bechorah. It meant nothing to him. The spiritual dimension of being the spiritual leader of Klal Yisrael going forward meant nothing to him. And here we find a very interesting thing, that the responses to the death of a great man can be so diametrically opposite. But what the Torah tells us is the correct response is to think, now that this great man has passed away, it needs a new generation of leaders to pick, to pick up where he left off, to take the wisdom, the courage, and the chesed that permeated every moment of his life and to take it into the next generation. And that is really uh, the great message that Yaakov gives us here in Parshas Told Us and which we re really should respond wherever we can to such a critical moment in our lives. And the Possek says about the original Chanoich, who was the father of Mr. Shalach, in Bereshit chapter 5, by Yishalech Chanoich Eswalohim, that Chanoich walked with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and at one point, and suddenly he wasn't there anymore. It says Rabbi Yenusim ben Uziel and Pirkat Rabbi Yezer, picked up here by the Nativ, he became a Malach. He left this world like Eliyahu Hanovi left this world. We needed him. He guided us. He inspired us. And now and now he's no longer with us. His memory will always be a blessing for all of us and for all of us to somehow continue in the tradition that he would have wanted, and to bring about only a Kiddush Hashem B'chein Yirotzen.